Marsha Martin, City Council. Susie Valvo Ferry, Mayor Pro Tem. Chiquita Yapo, City Council. Joan Heck, Mayor. Sean McCoy, City Council. Aaron Rodriguez, City Council. Uh, Harold Dominguez, City Manager. <coughs> Eugene May, City Attorney. Diane Chris, City Council. Don Quintana, City Clerk. No, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to <laughs> be in the roll call. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's also remember that this is a discussion among the, the counselors and um, not to pull staff into the conversation because if you need one on one with them later, they're, they're available. So um, let's just start with you, Marcia, since you're. Okay. Well, I only have two to really discuss because because I was out of state. I, you know, I skipped the board meetings, okay, because I was doing family stuff. Um, but um, the two the most active uh, boards that I have um, are the water board and the um, senior advisory board. And they both have one big topic that was took up most of the discussion of the, the last uh, thing. And they both are um, policy matters. Mm -hmm. um, so senior advisory board, there's really a lot less um, discussion um, in terms of council policy, although um, you know, one, of, one of the issues with it is that this is this initiative by the senior citizens advisory board is, is coming after budget time and you know I guess it's you know they need to be ready to start this in April for 2025. But they have succeeded in recruiting um, new people. You know, we'll confirm them tonight. So I guess, I don't think it's possible that any of them can get confirmed. But anyway, um, a much more, um, people joining will be much more diverse and connected to different communities. Um, than has happened in the past is pretty, pretty, pretty much it was like, um, you know, mostly old white women like me and um, not a lot of other people. But this year we have um, a, a, uh, an African American man joining us who is very active in, as a volunteer in the community as well and, um, and a bilingual Hispanic woman, um, and I, like I said, they're not confirmed yet, but we're really excited. And the big deal, the big initiative that the board wants to have is um, how do we engage the rest of the community? Because really the senior advisory board, you know, it spends a lot of time looking at who the users are mm -hmm. and the um, the users of the senior center don't represent the whole community. They represent maybe half the community and maybe not the half of the community that could benefit the most mm -hmm. um, from what the senior center does. So uh, one of the big ideas, and this is the after discussion thing, mm -hmm. um, one of the big ideas was that almost everyone said, and that's why I was asking those questions, on the, mm -hmm. on the weekend mm -hmm. that, um, that if there could be open times at the senior center like Saturday morning or a couple evenings a week that different parts of the community could um, use, make more use of the senior center. And make more use of the building. You know, it's a really wonderful, nice, inviting building. Um, and and it's kind of waste than only being open, you know, 42 hours a week or how much it's, how much it's open. So uh, the staff and the senior advisory board are really very much interested in, in trying to find ways to do that. And we understand that it's a, a long budget planning thing, but it would be great if in 2025 we had not only um, more universal programming for the senior center, but more accessible hours for the senior center. So that's the one. The other thing, this was was just Monday, yesterday. Um, 
was that uh, Ken Newson actually uh, called me in advance to, so that I could be prepared to talk <coughs> to the um, board and the staff about this because they know from uh, numbers that are coming in that we are going to need to raise the fee in lieu for water rights um, for future annexations. Mm -hmm. And um, the staff and pretty much kind of the board mm -hmm. were sort of thinking, well, we knew, know what these new expenses are. Mm -hmm. Our work is done, you know. And so we had kind of a big discussion about all of the policy factors that really influence where we really do set that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't want to, we don't want the fee lieu to be at a loss, except possibly, possibly to subsidize affordable housing. But for commercial builders, we don't want it to be a loss. But there's also all kinds of other factors, like how much we want to bring builders in. <coughs> what adjacent communities are charging, mm -hmm. and how many more parcels there are um, to be annexed, and how, deficit, how, how big of a water rights deficit we have, and how big a pool of, of um, annexed land that hasn't paid their fee yet because they haven't broken ground or, or you know, mm -hmm. achieved a plaque. So there's a, a really big chunk of data analysis that has to be done. And yes, the council will make the policy decisions about where we set that, but um, we need to have a full set of quantitative data presented to us in order to make that decision informed. Because those of you who have, were here long enough, at this point it might just be me and Joan. Could be. Um, uh, but you know, the last time we had a big step in the cost of water to, mm -hmm. to be added, oh, and Aaron, you yeah. were there, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, but, uh, um, to remember, do you know, the, <laughs> oh, Aaron, Aaron definitely would remember. Um, but uh, the public said, what? You guys are leaving all kinds of money on the table, you know, so they held us to account. Mm -hmm. And we had not enough data and we had to, send the decision back to the staff mm -hmm. in order to get the rest of the data. So the idea was, um, let's, next year, let's get it right the first time mm -hmm. so that we can have a good discussion. Great. So those are the two newses that I have. Okay. And um, on this one again, it would, this might be a good time to discuss how we as a new council mm -hmm. um, feel about that policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not tonight. No, not tonight okay. for, for long, <laughs> you know, although yeah. I'm... Um, yeah, so Yeah, because we need the data discussion, yeah. and, the, mm -hmm. and the true policy discussion, of course, needs to be had in public. Yes. Yeah. But... Thank you. That was, a, that was good. Yeah. A lot of information. Yeah. So, for me, the, the two big ones that I want to report back are the library advisory board and the museum advisory board. So the museum, we met, we're not meeting this month, but last month, so I had to pull up my notes from last time. And really it was just looking, you know, updating the advisory board on the, um, how much they had raised. So as of November 6th, it was 6.5 million that was raised for the capital campaign. Mm. So, and that was prior to the Colorado Gives. So we'll get updated numbers the next time we meet. Um, so that was, you know, that's, that's exciting news. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things in kind of piggybacking off of what Marsha had said, so we had to um, cancel, I think it was our, our October meeting for lack of quorum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have one woman whose health, I mean, she ended up having to resign from the board because of health concerns. And you know, just kind of Is trying that to library or museum, just museum, okay. museum advisory board. So that was I was referring to the capital campaign, which is yeah, the yeah. extension of the museum advisory board um, from the museum. Just clarifying. And yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that had been kind of you know getting people to show up 
as well as you know we have unfilled seats so if one person's gone that's you know we we can't meet for lack of quorum and so you know really how can we get people more engaged in this you know applying for the museum library you know different boards i heard you say this before and so we were kind of um you know kind of mulling around you know i made the suggestion the library board we do hybrid we have one um member who's has daycare issues so we've made accommodations to have a hybrid and that seems to be working we haven't had to cancel meetings and people are able to participate last night i was able to participate online because i'm still all yeah. <laughs> um, so that was you know that that was helpful um the consensus of the board at uh, the museum board was to not do that to keep it all in person so you know we're kind of kind of mulling around how can we get the word out there for people to apply and be engaged in this in this work and the importance of these advisory boards so that was a big uh, discussion for that um, uh, library board we met yesterday and again you know we have they gave us that resolution you know really holding the city council in the city to um, to make that commitment we've said that we value the library so you know where's where's the money to kind of support that and you know it was very I mean I hear over and over again the members are very disappointed with the outcome of the election um, and you know people don't realize the importance of the library and the fact that our programs are free you know and so one of the discussions we had was okay then charging for some of these programs and you know that board was kind of split on that because we really want to have this be an inclusive equitable um, system for for our residents but these things cost money and then to throw it on the friends of the library where their whole purpose was to provide extra programming not the essentials and um, so it was we had some hard discussions last night and you know it was really you know and a lot of them came on me <laughs> and it was like well you know where's you know you say you you are committed to the library city council says they are committed to the library where's the money to show that and how are we going to make up the deficit because of you know, well, I'm waiting for all those free market people to start cutting checks so we can start building the French library, but that's, <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of, um, they're, they're going to be coming to council more often. They're going to be making their, their voices heard. And, um, you know, our biggest concern is that we lose quality people. Uh, we have Lillian who does the bilingual, a lot of the youth programming, and I just, She's a one-man powerhouse, and she's going out there to all these different events and running these programs at the parks and um, at the um, Parents Involved in Education monthly, where, and I've been involved with PAI, the Padres Involucrados in Educación, and I've been involved with them in the past for several years. And their daycare part, you know, they provide dinner for families and the kids that came, it was a daycare. It was just babysitting she has really upped it to provide quality programming. So we have really quality staff, but they are, they are stretched really thin. And so that was, that's the concern of the Library Advisory Board is, how are we going to ensure that we keep these, these staff members who are high quality and by not stretching them too thin, but still keep these quality programs available for public. So that was, um, yeah, that was kind of the gist. I mean, we can go into more discussion later. All right. So um, I mean, we were, I was in um, Atlanta for LDDA, so I missed that one. Mm -hmm. And the uh, next one is tomorrow, actually. It's usually the fourth. So anyway, um, transportation. And I thought we were starting our new boards next year but i end up going to broomfield 7 30 in the morning mm -hmm. for the nata or nata what is it north area transportation, transportation. Associate. Oh, yes okay. so i showed up to that and um thank you 
Yeah. yeah, it was very informative, although half of it I didn't know what they were talking about. I mean, it's transportation, uh, but you know, some of the things that they had already discussed prior. Um, basically, just continuing on, they really definitely going to continue the zero fare for youth, and um, um, they're looking at, oh, they were talking about legislative, um, those who have gone to, to change legislation, and about um, the employees, like the bus drivers and everything, who are getting assaulted, and when they press charges, nothing happens to the those who suppose they don't get prosecuted, mm -hmm. and so that's an issue with their staffing because mm -hmm. people really do not want to be want to work mm -hmm. um, because they're scared of people assaulting them on the bus, so and assaulting their operators. So that's a huge, huge issue right now, which is of course. Um, employees staffing um, and the next meeting is next month on the 25th um, so since I went to that and that's just a little bit of what I was like wow I didn't I didn't know that um, check on their RTD website they have like six different everything is in six different languages mm -hmm. so I thought that was pretty cool um, so yes yeah, so I'll switch on over to our transportation Basically, and Diane, if anything, I miss you were there, so you can uh, definitely update or say, she can you forget that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we talked about the year-end report, the 2024 work plan. Of course, it could be adjusted and modified, but that's also, that's on the website, and that's a huge report, so I don't need to go over that. Um, they talked about, uh, we talked about the Main Street safety improvements, um, and the Kaufman Street Multimodal Improvement Project, everything is up to date. I mean, everything is on the move. Um, more grant, I believe we got another grant from um, Phil had gotten some more money. Um, that Phil, I tell you. Yeah, yeah. it's go get her. Yeah. Um, and basically, they just provided all the updates for the multimodal capital um, mm -hmm. projects. Um, Housing and Human Services, last my last day was Thursday, right after Sister Cities, because I would go to Sister Cities and hop on over to <laughs> and Human Services. Uh, what we talked about in there was um, over a million dollars were requested for funding and applications, and every year it has increased. And um, so what we talked about possibly that maybe they, you know, you know, we have our different buckets of what are priorities. Maybe we need to narrow down the priorities, of uh, not being so broad because there are other nonprofits who are already doing some of that work that provide those services. Um, and is it worth the time for nonprofits to only, although they gave people a little bit of money um, here and there, so if you give $1,000 here, $2,000 there, but yet they're asking for 25000 was that worth that time for, mm -hmm. for, you know, especially the grassroots organizations, was it really worth their time to do that application? Um, that $1,000, because that person wage costs more than that for them to sit there and do those applications and the reporting that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, that's what they were talking about um, when I came in the latter part of it. Uh, sister cities, they still need maybe a few more students to go. Um, they left it open for a few more students for Arapahoe, uh, Guzman, and I think we're full for Japan. I myself will be a chaperone for Japan this next year. I'm, to I'm so excited. Um, they asked me that I want to go as a government official because they get a lot of perks. And I said, well, if we all can't get perks, then no, mm -hmm. I don't want to. Um, because I want to experience what the students experience so if it's a great experience that they get all the perks that I get then that's cool but I don't want to be separated from the kids mm -hmm. I want to learn that's the whole point of me going as a chaperone so we don't know the exact dates of that but we do know it's supposed to be in July um, we are supposed to know at the end of this month because their school is year-round and so is when they can um, they're going to check and see when it would be a good time for us to be there for their students in Japan. So, yeah. Great. So, RCAB and for, uh, they had a discussion in regards to uh, uh, the changing uh, the online 
uh, aspect of that. So they want to do it where they rotate from different places to places. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for you, Diane, just so you kind of know, it's a Boulder County Resource Consortium Advisory Board. So that's our cap, and it's just about uh, uh, things like uh, EcoCycle and uh, uh, other elements like our A1 uh, composting and all of that. So it's fairly light. I mean, then the uh, consortium cities. The the big issue right now. Uh, we were we went to the actual emergency uh, uh, facility where, uh, when they have something like the Marshall Fire or something like this, they have a room like uh, uh, three times the size of this room here. It's got uh, 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 six to seven or more, uh, you know, televisions larger than this one here. They've got, uh, uh, it's just a total command center. And they have the ability to bug out of there if it were at like a, you know, a fire like the Martian fire were to come in uh, into that location. But uh, when they were looking at things for the flood and other aspects, they, you know, they went through the whole process of, uh, of that and, the, and they call it a fishbone, but they showed how any incident uh, has this sort of fishbone effect. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. And it used to be that they wanted uh, us as public officials to be all trained in this and then they realized we just need to be aware of it because we weren't going to be the experts behind the, uh, uh, the screens or anything like that. We might help in some way and I know many of you uh, when the Marshall Fire hit did certain things to help support these other communities uh, and, and stuff like that, but it probably wasn't from a, a uh, logistics sort of command control sort of uh, situation. So that's uh, that's where they were. And then they ended the meeting again with the, the uh, minimum wage discussion. Uh, I sent an email on to uh, uh, Martha Lokman, who is pushing this right now, to ask her, has she had conversations with uh, either one of the school boards or their superintendents about this issue because it would have an impact on on them uh, in the sense of raising minimum wage jobs like some of their pair pros and some of their janitorial staff and things like that and I haven't received a response back from her and that's been a week and a half. So that's where that board is, is pretty much. And, and I'm going to interrupt. Um, for Mar to Marta's defense, she's had some personal issues oh, okay. it has not been entering. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, Mark may, might, uh, uh, might be handling some of this, so I, I can reach out to him and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and see what uh, has happened. To, because it, you kind of got to include all these stakeholders in this uh, if you're going to start proceeding this way. They want to go down this. I still believe that it's probably a legislative issue that really probably should have should be handled in broadly, but uh, uh, because it uh, uh, has some elements of, of problems in the sense that uh, uh, if Longmont and Louisville and Lafayette and Erie and all the surrounding areas come in as a unit uh, to, to go with this, what we might see is a bunch of people uh, you know, having shortages in places like Fort Lupton and, and other parts just as you cross I-25 that uh, people want to come here because they clearly get a better wage for doing the same jobs they do just on the opposite side of I-25. So that's a that's a factor that uh, probably should be uh, you know pushed more at the legislative level because that's kind of the same issue when we're dealing with some of the gun issues. We know that if you can't get other communities to, to get along with, uh, uh, change their policies, uh, people will just go there to get their uh, weapon of choice. And so it's that sort of situation too, uh, you're creating a disparity and so obviously people want to uh, want to uh, come where they are going to get paid even if they have to drive a little bit. There's probably a cost savings in some of that in reality. So that's basically and I still don't know. Outside of us having holding a vote on this, I don't know where to really go forward with them mm -hmm. on that. But I just feel like it still hasn't quite been <coughs> uh, uh, enough information. You know, it seems like we almost need uh, uh, maybe some clarify, you know, clarification in regards to 
what that actually looks like. Are they going to want to, we really want to have 16-year-olds, uh, you know, at that, uh, I mean, there's going to be some question about on-the-job training and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a discussion to be held. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, Historic Preservation Commission, I think we've all seen kind of the culmination of their work over the last year. Uh, just last week, I believe we voted on uh, initially the, the recommendations that they made to for the code changes as far as demolition and those kinds of things. Um, tonight we have the appeal again. Uh, mm -hmm. and so I think, uh, you know, we read about that in our packets. Mm -hmm. And then also, I, I think everybody has received, I don't, you know, Councilmember Chris probably hasn't received the email, but the one we got uh, from uh, Commissioner Jacoby uh, that outlined what he thought the Commission's uh, decision was based on the overlay district, which I know we'll be having a conversation about that based on the motion of the mayor. Um, <coughs> and that's really taken up the vast majority of the year. Uh, for that particular commission. Um, uh, Longmont Public Media, you know, they've gotten to the point now where they've added so much program, so many programs uh, to try to get as much uh, participation and memberships and, and things like that, uh, that they've gotten to the point now where they're, they're starting to reevaluate and see maybe if some of the programs need to be leaned. Uh, just you know for capacity reasons and maybe there's not the uptake of, of participation that we're anticipating but I think that was kind of the right direction was open up the cornucopia of possibilities and then see what really is the popular stuff and then you know pair back the stuff that didn't didn't necessarily become as popular um, and then with planning and zoning commission I think they after the bond farm uh, sessions I think they got a little bit of a break I mean they, they had meetings but they were not as contentious I, I know that one was the Boston Road just by the sugar factory that was one that they already came to us um, and then they wished a fond farewell to Commissioner Josh Goldberg who had been there 10 years wow. he had his two five-year terms and he was terminated so <coughs> What do you have for us, Diane? <laughs> well, I dropped in with Visit Longmont, and we're starting our first meeting tomorrow, so I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not as early in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned some things about the airport during our interview process that I think Visit Longmont will be interested to hear, mm -hmm. uh, because there's some reasons to come here just because of that airport. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, also in interviews related a bit to the transportation board, which I was uh, publicly invited to heard there um, because they're talking about having electric bicycles uh, bicycle stations around town and uh, the airport I mentioned that they might like to have that available to them so and then uh, the thing with the master plan for transportation mm -hmm. a lot of it um, with RTD is going to go more regional so try to focus on micro transit just my conversations with the city and realize that we may be getting close to micro transit mm -hmm. so yeah, so there's a lot of look at the budget of, about that too, of transportation dollars to make sure that they support that. A lot of excitement for the yes. transit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before I get Mike, Don, would you want to tell um, the rest of council what you said about um, the historic uh, long about that presentation or that deal we're going to have to I will let the planning staff introduced, but I believe that that item is going to request postponement tonight. We'll see. We were then well, notified today. Yeah, late afternoon. Late afternoon that the applicant is delayed on that flight. Delayed, That's had a flight delay and can't be here, and so requested to continue. Okay. So, my turn. Mm -hmm. I had four things that I was going to bring up, but I think I'm going to start with only two and it would four don't make it, that's fine with me. Um, remember my password. Uh, the first one is the ethics code. I, I did have a meeting with Eugene, which I canceled because 
the campaign, I needed to take something off my plate during the campaign, so that left. Mm -hmm. However, during uh, that time after the campaign is over and today, I did meet with um, Marika and Ian from IT and we discussed and they gave me a draft of what a website for complaints would look like so that um, we had a place to direct people to go if they had a complaint about a council person or a, a, a board member or a commission member and um, I will have that draft ready for in January and uh, Susie has agreed to help me with that. Mm -hmm. So if she still wants to agree to help me with that, I will uh, throw a draft to her, to Wordsmith, to look at, uh, to make sure that it all makes sense, as far as we know, and then it goes to legal. And um, then it comes back to council to tear apart, mm -hmm. or uh, look at, see if you want to work with it or change it or whatever. Uh, the one thing that IT needs before they can, we can actually go on that website is uh, we need to know who the committee would be um, and Harold and I have talked about a hearing officers for who's going to look at the complaints, who did they go to, etc. So um, that's just an idea that we'll discuss but um, that is what I will present because I would rather um, in, in previous pre-sessions, Diane, um, it was agreed that I could just do it. <laughs> and I asked if anybody wanted to help, and they said, no, go for it. So uh, I'm just pulling from Fort Collins um, Code of Ethics. She, the attorney there gave me permission to use their language. Um, and from Denver's Code of Ethics, and a little bit from Colorado Springs, so it's kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, but it hits the points that I think that makes sense. But when it comes back, then we can say that's ridiculous or no, we don't want to do that or whatever. So council's input's really important because it is our code of ethics. Um, so that's the update on that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, I was going to t uh, update on PRPA because I think it's extremely important that we all understand what's going on there, but I'm going to leave that unless we have time. I want to, first of all, go straight to RTD. And um, uh, we all have read or heard that Front Range Passenger Rail got the $500,000 grant for their corridor ID plan which is huge. Uh, we were waiting and waiting for that. We're supposed to hear from, about it in uh, October and then in November, but finally in December they awarded the uh, grants and Front Range Passenger Rail got one of them. And the reason that's important is that with that $500,000 grant, uh, it is FRA telling us that we have a good plan, they like it, and that they will give us all the help we need to make it work. So um, I'm really excited about that, but that means we're going to work our tails off mm -hmm. because the governor wants the vote for the FRPR district on the November 2024 ballot. So we're working on several things, on marketing, on uh, ballot language. Um, uh, we, we chose the uh, alignment from Fort Collins to Pueblo or Pueblo to Fort Collins, whatever you want. There's a lot of discussion about that. Um, and there's the reason that was chosen was because we are going to use existing rail. The cost of building another rail or, or uh, making it a double line uh, is very, very expensive. So getting into it right away and doing the backbone is what we're concentrating on. Uh, that is going to happen, whether we like it or not. I think it's a great thing that's going to happen for the Front Range. However, I have told um, at every single Front Range Passenger Rail District meeting that I am not going to sell to our residents the idea that we're going to be in two recaps for two rail districts. Um, I had heard uh, at our retreat that RTD was going to be a player, but then on Monday I had a conversation with the executive director of, our, of uh, FRPR and they are not. 
So RTD is doing their own thing, Front Range P uh, FRPR is doing <coughs> their own thing, totally separate districts. To that end, um, my frustration is what everybody's been frustrated about. RTD refuses to move the date of the uh, Northwest Rail Corridor from 2050, which puts that 46 years since our vote and over $100,000. Hundred no, sorry, hundred million dollars <coughs> that we would have put into this. The reason they're putting it 2050 is because they have bonds that are not going to come due until 2050. Um, they're bought, they don't have any more bonding authority until they pay that off. Um, but uh, the the fast tracks is solvent, which means. I don't know exactly what that means because if we owe dollars for bonds, it means that um, our dollars are needed to pay off those bonds. So um, that is unacceptable to me completely that we are going to be caught in two different uh, mm -hmm. rail districts. Um, there's no path forward with uh, Northwest Corridor, RTD has made no plans for construction, they haven't purchased any cheap steel and put it in a warehouse so when we have money we can start building um, so to that end uh, I, I want your input um, shall we tonight at tonight's meeting direct uh, our staff to hold an executive session uh, to discuss an exit strategy for RTD's fast tracks part of uh, the district the RTD district Question. I would support that if there is any possible exit strategy. Um, and I would like a discussion about uh, how the governor expects the RTD, the unserved segments of RTD, to vote for another rail district. And I don't, I've given and the population distribution, I'm thinking could pass without us. So, um, we, what we need to do is how much the government, governor and the legislature can intervene. And they're working on that right now. Uh, Faith Winters, the land use bill that um, that the governor put out last year, it wasn't a bill, it was a concept plan, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that he was going to, that he was going to put on the ballot. Um, he broke it up into three parts. Transportation, which Faith Winters, uh, Senator Faith Winters has, uh, the land use itself and then the uh, ADUs, the, the transit-oriented development part. So he's got three different sections now which I think he's going to run. Part of his plan, I think, um, and at the mayors and commissioners meeting, Kyle, and I forget his last name, but he is the one who replaced Tracy Burnett in the Brown. legislature. Yeah. Kyle Brown. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. He came and talked to us and basically said he's working with Faith Winters and they don't know what they're going to do. He said, mm -hmm. give me your input. And Faith Winters uh, emailed me and said, give me everything, absolutely everything that you think we should do for transportation. So mm -hmm. Phil and I just filled an email full of stuff. Um, so they're struggling, everybody's struggling, but RTD is not going to be part of FRPR. Hmm. So, um, and to your point, Marcia, that is the point of the executive session to discuss should we do this, can we do this? Mm -hmm. and, I, I didn't mean uh, to support it, but the yeah. executive session. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be in support of it, but we've had executive session on the subject, which was not very promising. So. Well, and the executive, but. In that executive session in 2021, we, if I, if memory serves me right, we basically said, let's wait and see what happens. And, um, and that is because FRPR was just beginning. And at that point, and um, uh, where did I write this down? I have to follow notes. Um, mm -hmm. At the very beginning, the discussion was that we would have a 3 p it would be a three-part partnership with CDOT, FRPR, and RTD. And that's why I said, let's wait and see. 
I just remember the legal aspect of not uh, about being able to remove ourselves from the ballot issue that was voted on originally being tenuous at best. But we never gave um, direction to staff to, to uh, litigate. Right. And that's I, just, I, I guess I remember the conversation differently. No, but we never came out of that executive session and said to give direction to litigate or not to litigate. Right, because I remember the conversation differently in the sense that uh, in the red light, green light, or red light, yellow light, green light concept, we were nowhere close to a green light from a litigation point. That was my recollection of that conversation. But. Okay. So, I, I guess I want to know if, if I should make this uh, motion tonight. I would support it, you know, given that the, the two things have changed, right? I, I remember that executive session as being, well, we as a municipality or even as whatever, we're District 11 or 13 or whatever in the RTD, um, you know, even as that entity, we have no power to exit. It didn't have standing. Yeah, we had no standing, and so. Um, I'd like to remind council those conversations are confidential. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it was in an executive session. It was in an executive, executive session. Yeah. So anyway, we I think we decided there was nothing we could do at that point, but we would need the support of the legislature. Or can we can we talk about this in an executive session? Yes. That's the whole point. Okay. This Correct. Discussion should be it. happening here. Yeah. So I'll we'll support it. Yes, I'll support it also. Welcome to the discussion. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is PRPA just as an update. Um, the what? Sorry, I didn't hear. PRPA. Oh. Uh, we had gotten, and, and I don't know if all council got these, but the board got hundreds of letters from. Uh, uh, groups like Sierra Club, 360.org, um, etc., that are not happy that for reliability on PRPA for our dark calm days, that we are going to have uh, aero derivative gas turbines. They don't want any gas at all. And they said we need, instead of putting out an RFP just for um, te technology, I, just for an aero derivative uh, turbine, we need to have all source RFPs, which means that we would put out a request for a proposal or bids uh, information from all sources of storage uh, and natural resources that could get us the reliability we need on dark calm days. So this was a, a question, this was a good discussion that we had on PRPA and to tell you the truth, the, the board members learned a lot because information came that we had never had before. And between 2020, 2020 and 2023, PRPA had actually put out four all source RFPs with 71 responses. So they had information and responses on those RFPs from all kinds of manufacturers that were doing storage, that were doing uh, uh, solar, that were doing wind, uh, that were doing uh, hydroelectric, um, and our staff went to some of these manufacturers, to some of these companies, and actually looked at their what they were producing and out of that there's one that we're still keeping an eye on and that is the one in California that is developing 100 hour uh, storage units but they're nowhere near what they should be for us to use so in order for us not to uh, have blackout days for us to be able to be in our um, managed management like Weiss and the Southwest Energy um, pool, we have to be able to have the energy that we can sell and buy from other 
energy utility companies within that pool. So out of those uh, RFPs, those all source RFPs, came the aero derivative gas turbines. So we had a member, we, we signed an agreement to give permission to uh, PRPA to start the um, what is the permitting process. The permitting process, which is taking a very long time. The other thing that I learned um, is that we are a very small utility company. So when we need to purchase something, it is now supply and demand, and the manufacturers have all the power because the demand is worldwide. Um, we're very small, so if we need turbines, if we, whatever it is we want to purchase, we're coming up against Excel, who is purchasing a lot of them, or like the Arizona Public Service Company, which they're buying tons of it. They don't want, we're, we're on the bottom of the list because we're small, we're only four cities. So um, that is what is holding up some of our moving forward, our momentum to move forward. So I think that the public needs to understand some of this when, um, if you hear that we're not moving fast enough, that we're not doing uh, our job, we're, we're, I totally have faith in what PRPA is doing. And uh, we're having more in-depth conversations on the board and not just uh, just questioning staff mm -hmm. in a deeper, more meaningful way for us. So that's it. Those are my, um, that's it. That's all I've got. I'd like to add something about PRPA. Okay. Um, having um, talked to the local activist community and 350.org and um, and the Sierra Club going bonkers over new gas plants. Um, but if you talk to NREL or if you talk to, um, you know, uh, the federal regulatory agencies or anybody who uh, does not have an ideological thing behind them one way or the other, um, and NREL, NREL is really pretty much gung-ho behind renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, PRPA is right, and 350.org, et cetera, are asking for the moon. Um, so I personally, it, you know, with, with my clean energy industry experience, uh, I, I have no quarrel with what uh, PRPA is doing at the moment. I think they're doing the right thing. And uh, the, the no new gas ask is just not attainable um, with with present day technology, not by 2030. No, it isn't there. Um, yeah. So I thought, you know, because what's going to happen, I, I can tell you that, that in fact, the way they have that set up, that if you weren't on the PRPA board, you didn't get those letters, because I didn't get them as a, as a council member. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's the next thing, right, is that they'll send them to the whole council. And, and That's why I wanted council to understand what we're doing and where we're going so that you can support the city and support PRPA's mm -hmm. uh, path. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I forgot to say is that Jenny, who is, Jenny is the mayor of Fort Collins, she went to um, COP28. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Dubai. She went to Dubai for the COP28 conference and came back and reported to us and said that there were people in uh, renewable energy from all over the world and no one has an answer. That we're all struggling with the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> at COP28 there were also hundreds of oil and gas people. Mm -hmm. So they were doing their yeah. own thing yeah. as well. Yeah. But um, I, I was glad to hear that because it made me feel that we've had people coming to PRPA saying that uh, Austin, Texas is doing this, they're 100% renewable, and then Raj pulled up their, uh, their uh, whole mm -hmm. yeah. platform of what they're using, and they're using coal and gas mm -hmm. as well as yeah. some renewable, and they are, their target is 2035. 
So we are right in there and uh, working as hard as we can, but I think our board has learned that we need to ask better questions and more questions. So, so we, and they had a good presentation here up here. They did. Mm -hmm. Really, I, I was very impressed with them. So the board did a good job mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. the, the last, um, the, the last board meeting, I, I, I felt that the, the board did a much better job of of standing up for its several communities mm -hmm. than it had than I've ever seen happen before. Well, I think what happens, and it happens on council too, is we get a presentation, but because we've discussed it in first ordinance, second ordinance, or it comes before we have the first ordinance, we understand it better and sometimes don't ask questions for the residents to understand. Mm -hmm. Because we've read it, we've seen it, we've heard about it, and yeah. sometimes we go to staff and get more information. Mm -hmm. So they give a presentation and it looks like we're all just sitting there like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not really the truth, yeah. No, it's not true. So it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the exact same thing. So. Okay, does anybody want to discuss anything else? Well, I did. Um, uh, just uh, the Monday before the, the uh, election, I went to Hope. And uh, mm -hmm. Hope is, is struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're struggling on two counts. It seems like they ha are, the way they describe it, they might be running a deficit and they, they're trying to figure out how to, to cover that. Uh, and the, and with, the big, with the discussion about unhoused and homeless folks in our community, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the fact that they are moving from two different churches and the setup and the teardown every night uh, you know, and every morning, is, is really starting to grate on them, and it would be nice if we could try to find some uh, location that they could be permanent in. I think that would keep some of their costs down, and I think uh, that's something that uh, uh, I know that uh, we need to maybe either lobby our legislators and, and stop giving people tax credits for holding their properties out of uh, uh, the market? Uh, huh? The market? Yeah, the market is, is a little ridiculous. I mean, that should not be a tax credit. That should be like, well, why are you not doing this? We built this. I mean, I see, you know, my understanding jumping to like Dr. Cog and that sort of thing where we have these ideas of where we should put certain businesses and, and industries. And it seems like we have, in, uh, you know, uh, corporate buildings that should be getting filled. And yet I drive up I-25 and see those exact type of buildings being built new. And mm -hmm. so if those buildings are not going to be utilized, we need to figure out some way of putting them into some sort of way, uh, mm -hmm. instead of some sort of aspect in either addressing our issue around uh, uh, affordable housing and attainable housing or uh, you know helping uh, the uh, homeless and the unhoused and, uh, and helping organizations like Hope that are trying to find at least a permanent well, So that's that's a that's an issue right there that I think uh, needs to be uh, put on the uh, front burner. I'd like to have Hope if we could come to uh, a council meeting and, and reiterate you know what their their real needs are because it's a it's a struggle because they do such a good job in the community with some of the more difficult parts of of that. Uh, Community ask, uh, population that you know we need to figure out what we can do to make that happen, and uh, and we probably need to hold some of these these you know commercial buildings uh, owners accountable for leaving these things for us to deal with. The other thing is this: uh, it's I'm concerned about the issue of uh, a year ago before I was on council, just before I was on council, young man got uh, shot uh, down at, 15th, uh, at uh, Hover and, and Nelson. And that attractive nuisance of that big parking lot is something that uh, if, if they're not gonna do something with it, that, uh, you know, that's, that's on now us as a community to police and to make sure that uh, that Walmart parking lot is, is, uh, is uh, you know, safe from 
from uh, you know impromptu uh, you know meetups for racing mm -hmm. and other stuff like that. That's that's a problem, and uh, and if they're not going to put something there that deters that, you know, some sort of commercial building or some sort of activity down there to deters that, then that's putting it back on our police and safety to have to make sure that it's not all of a sudden we're, we're using resource city resources and I and I feel like that's something we should maybe discuss about, you know, how do we claw some of that resource back if they're not going to do something serious about it. Because that's that's not okay. We're we're struggling here to try to make sure uh, uh, you know other issues are of safety are are handled, not to have to face something that should be uh, should have been managed literally years ago. Can I jump in? Yes. So that's one of the um, tenements of uh, Vision Zero is to repurpose those those parking lots and put facilities there that will you know, so we don't have to build more parking lots so we're not so we're utilizing what already exists and uh, transportation has committed to not expanding any roads and to repurposing parking lots. So the idea is you know, I think perhaps using city services there as a beginning to attract other businesses. That maybe might be tempted to build or you know uh, go somewhere else to say let's repurpose what we have. This is a great place for development. So maybe that would help. That, those initiatives and those task forces that would help. I think pushing in all directions into that initiative. I, I hope that would be a good discussion to have, especially when we. But we have to also look at the aspect that we don't own those parking lots. Mm -hmm. right. And that, if I remember right, Hobby Lobby has first uh, refusal on that parking lot. It, that's a crazy, crazy mess. Property location. Mm -hmm. um, that's partially why it's so difficult to do anything because there are, on one parcel, there's multiple owners. Yep. That's actually why that Walmart building was torn down because the owners couldn't agree, and then Hobby Lobby actually has. Right, if you're uh, well, they have rights on what's developed oh. based on the contracts that were signed between them. Hmm. Um, there is somebody that I think is working through now developing something there, but they we've spent time with them trying to figure out the logistics of the property lines, <laughs> and uh, that is just. Crazy well, our, our services to them for safety and for the safety of our community is, is not free. And mm -hmm. they need to just, uh, do something with it. And, and that might be a well, under benefit from more foot traffic, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just finding out what would be happening. Mm -hmm. The access to that area, too, is this Gordy knot. I mean, you drive oh, in yeah. there and you yeah. can't ever get out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Especially when you want to go to that bakery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever go in and out the same way. No. <laughs> can't yes. 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 So um, we should probably start <coughs> thinking about what we want to see on the retreat, because Sam is going to be asking us. Yeah, I know. <laughs>